Thank you very much. Thank you, Veronique. Thank you to Jump for inviting me here today. Um, what I will show you today is a really a sneak preview of some new work that we are doing at the moment and which is about to be published. Um, as Veronique mentioned, we are running a large gender initiative at the OECD where we look at different aspects of gender equality um, in education, employment, and entrepreneurship, and also ex increasingly expanding into other areas as well. And um, since we also have a big initiative on the future of work and the future of social protection, we've been looking at how these two things fit together. How will the future of work, as far as we know what it's going to look like, because obviously there's a lot of ifs here, what might that look like for men in relation to what it might look like for women. So um, let me give you a few of our ideas and you'll see that the picture is mixed. I can tell you right away, you're not going to go out of this presentation with a very clear idea whether it's going to be a feminine future of work or a masculine or both. So um, let's start by thinking about the pluses on the left side. Um, what could digitalization bring for women, particularly in the workforce? And of course, one of the first things that comes to mind and something that I'm sure all of you are already experiencing is more flexibility in work. When to work, how to work, where to work, um, which makes it much easier to combine work with family uh, responsibilities or let's say with other responsibilities because let's say it's not only family responsibilities, more flexibility is also something that's interesting for people without caring responsibilities. Another point is that automation is likely to replace jobs that are easily replaceable and often physical labor. And these are jobs which often are not really feminine jobs. So jobs that are more in service, jobs that have more human interaction, and I'll show you some numbers on that later. So that is one additional point where we could think that perhaps it is more favorable for women than for men. There's a premium on soft skills in the new world of work. Everybody is saying, and our education people at the OECD keep repeating to us, that non-cognitive skills are becoming even more important than they are today in the future. By that we mean the resilience of people to bounce back after difficulties, adapting to new work styles, um, being good in, in communicating, interacting with people, all of these things that Unfortunately, you don't learn often enough at school. Um, it's clear that we don't, what we often have to learn in school is um, learning by heart, learning facts, um, which today one Google search will give you all of this. So there's a strong emphasis on other facts and this is where girls, are, young women are particularly good often. And the last point is that um, we know that with aging populations, there's going to be more need for health services. Um, but also education, social services more broadly, which are, again, as you will see, very feminine. Now let's look at the potentially negative side. There's concerns about job quality, because it's one thing, it's, it's nice to think that you're working forever, but, uh, and wherever, but it's not, it shouldn't be forever wherever, but it should be still within limits. And um, for some people, flexibility has meant 24 seven, which is not what we want to do, and that doesn't improve job quality. Flexibility can also mean rather than having a proper job, you just have a succession of gigs. And again, that is not necessarily something that is in either male nor female workers' interest. Um, then uh, automation is probably not going to be restricted to what we see now, which is much in manufacturing. We see in Japan already robots increasingly becoming involved in caring. Um, we see the second tier jobs gradually being replaced. So take, take, because we used to think, okay, it's people we see in factories who build cars, they're going to be affected. Now it's financial analysts, for example. They used to spend a lot of time looking at markets, charging their clients a lot of money for it. You press three buttons and the computer will, in no time at all, spit out the report for which people were working days or even weeks before. So we can't be sure that those particularly feminine sectors will be spared from automation. And then, um, there's a big problem with STEM, and I'm sure that Jump has raised this already many times in previous conferences. Um, we don't have enough women in STEM. And while um, opportunities are not only in STEM, we know that in STEM, science, technology, technology, engineering, and math, there will be a particularly large number of jobs available. 
Now let's look at some numbers here. I'm from the OECD, so um, you're used to this by now. I always come with numbers. And what we have here is the employment rate among mothers versus the percentage of mothers who have worked from home at least once during the past year. Okay, so here on the bottom, on the x-axis, you have the percentage of people who've worked from remotely from home and the employment rate. And you can see it's a pretty neat fit here, particularly those like here. We have in Denmark, we have the highest percentage of those countries here of women, mothers who work from home, and it's also the highest employment rate. Sweden, Netherlands, Finland, and at the bottom you see um, other countries where nobody works or very few people work from home and very few people are in the labor force. Obviously, this is not causality. This is a correlation that shows how these two facts are related. Because in Turkey, you can't really say just because women can't work at home from home, they're not in the labor force. There's many other reasons why labor force participation of mothers in Turkey is very low. But at least this does give you an idea that it could be beneficial with new technologies to have mothers working from home, and that might be able, that might help increase their employment rate. So let's look now at the jobs. So this is, and, and I'm sure these will be also available to look at in, in, and like I said, we're going to put out very soon a brief that will explain all of this. What we did here is we looked at the shares of, job, uh, of jobs that are at risk of automation in different industries and by gender. So what you see here is a diff different sets of industries, and I'll talk about this in more detail. It starts with food and beverage, retail, wholesale, and so on. The red share, and this is the jump template we're using, so, but the way it came out is that men are red. This is not pink. Men are red and women are blue. So, um, and here is the employment share of women in each sector. So you can see, for example, here on the first one, we have um, a fairly high risk of automation for women, the blue bars, in the food and beverage service activities and in retail trade. Okay, this is the, those, and you can see that particularly in retail trade, the employment share of women is quite high. So um, that means that uh, this, these are, this retail sector will be one where females are going to be um, quite heavily affected. Now let's look at the ones where men are going to be more affected. So, and this is very interesting because it's not very surprising. Um, you have wholesale and, real, re, re, wholesale and retail trade and repair of motor vehicles, very masculine. Land transport and transport via pipelines, again, very masculine. Manufacturing of food products, metal products, specialized construction, um, so, and, and various other um, industries of manufacturing. So you can see very clearly that um, men's jobs here are much more at risk of automation. But now look at the employment share. The employment share here um, of women is, is also, uh, the employment share is quite small. So, so it's not going to make such a huge um, difference in the economy. So yes, the men are going to be much more affected, but this whole share of the sector is not going to be um, that big. So the total number of men who are going to be losing their jobs or at risk of losing jobs, we should say at risk, isn't that big. And finally, let's go to the typically female jobs where the female share is much bigger. Human health activities, social work activities, public administration, computer programming, women less risk, and education. And while you know, there's men and women at risk, the employment shares in education particular is very big. It's as big as retail. So even if women are not that strongly at risk, because there's lots and lots of women working in education, it'll still lead to larger numbers. So um, now we've looked at the situation, um, what, what happens, who's, who in the economy is going to be at risk? And these are um, share of jobs with high risk of automation, um, and average problem solving skills by gender. And what you see here is um, there's almost, take a look at the left panel, there's almost no difference between men and women actually. Men and women are pretty much at the same risk, but where there's a huge risk, it's difference is low wage people. 
So it's the low-wage jobs which are at much higher risk of automation, but no big gender difference. And then here, we also have um, problem-solving skills by gender and by wage group, okay? And here, um, here you can see that men have more um, problem-solving skills than men, uh, than women, sorry. The red bars are higher than those um, in, in all of the wage uh, levels. So um, this means that women have to catch up on problem solving. And if they don't have the skills for this new world of work, they're much more at risk. Finally, here we look at um, what type of skills people use at work. So panel A shows you how often you're influencing people. And here, men and women are pretty, and are, are pretty similar, but you can see the blue bars for every day are higher. So every day, women more often use influencing or influence people. But there also, there's a lot of, there's more women who never use their skills to influence people. So again, we see a polarization here. So women are affected in both ways. The panel B has a similar um, uh, thing that shows you um, how often you advise people. Again, women do it more every day, but also more never. And how often um, people are working physically for long hours. And, um, and here I found, I personally was surprised, of course, as we would expect, men more often work physically every day. But look, it's a large share of women also who work physically every day. So this also includes caring, for example, because there's a whole debate about unpaid care work now where they're saying lifting people is as hard as lifting sacks of concrete on a construction site. Um, then we also looked at um, uh, software users. How many people are using software by gender, uh, every day at work by gender? And here, there's no clear pattern. In some countries, you can see that men use it much more. For example, the Netherlands, which is on the left side, substantial difference. But then in other countries, New Zealand, for example, um, Denmark, uh, Estonia, Ireland, you have more women using software at work every day. So again, we don't see a clear pattern. And I have to tell you, we were kind of disappointed when we were doing this work because we were somehow trying to come up with a strong message. But we have to be honest, we look at the data and we can't really say, is it better for women or is it better for men? But we decided even that is worth a message, right? Because you know people automatically kind of assume, oh, there's going to be a lot of good things in here for women. And we don't necessarily see that there's a clear picture. Here, unfortunately, we have a very clear picture. These are the ICT, Information Communication Technology Specialists by Gender, as a percentage of total employment. The red bars are male, and the blue bars are female. And that's pathetic. Look at this. I mean, the women are never more than like 2%. And this is a problem, because we do know that these type of technologies will play a role. Not everybody has to be a computer specialist, but we will need more people going into these areas. And what we also see is, these are, this is employment, right? But it, we also see that in education, young women are not going into those areas. So, um, yes, this, is, this, is, this shows you the same picture. These are the graduates, and again, the red ones are the men, and the blue ones are the women, almost no graduates. Training, again, who's participating in training? No big difference between men and women, but a big difference is those um, who, uh, who should be participating the most um, are the low-income people. And actually, this is, I think this is, the, those people with the highest risk of, um, of automation, this is by risk, are the least likely to participate in training. Again, no difference between men and women, or not a big one. But the big thing is that those who are at highest risk should be receiving the most training, but they aren't. Again, warning sign. Oops. So very quickly, I know I have to finish, some policy impl implications. As I said, we need more women in STEM. That's a no-brainer. We have to remove barriers to lifelong learning, and particularly for low-income or low-wage workers, as you saw. These people need more training. Um, we have to close gender gaps in use and access to technology. We have to 
promote flexible ways of working, but always taking into account um, that there have to be good jobs. So all employees should have a right to request flexible working hours. We think we should encourage social partners much more to cover workplace flexibility and collective bargaining. And this is striking. I've asked trade unionists, when do gender issues, family policy issues, flexibility come on the table in the collective bargaining? And they say never. Because by the time everybody's finished, it's off the table, people leave the room, and it's not an issue. Um, then you have, we should be helping governors, should be helping companies adapt to flexible working, which is difficult because a lot of what has to happen here has to happen within companies and it's limited how much governments can really interfere. Um, as I said, we have to be careful that this does not come at, uh, at the cost of lower job quality. And we also have to be careful that we ensure gender equality in support for displaced workers. By displaced workers, we mean people who become unemployed because their industries are being automated or, um, or also moved into different countries. So let's be careful that we apply gender lens there also. And finally, last point, and this is a vast one and I won't even start getting into it, we have to adapt social protection systems to the new forms of work. Perhaps just one word because J JUMP is based in Brussels. The European Commission in its new social rights pillar has made very strong recommendations for parental leave and for better benefits and social protection for all workers, um, regardless of the, their forms of work, and I think that is a very encouraging initiative. Thank you very much.